I think we call this committee meeting to session. We'll start with our Pledge of Allegiance for tonight. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we will only do one roll call, so each individual committee does not have to do a roll call. We'll start. Mr. Boone? Present. Mrs. Campbell is absent. Ms. Bibla? Here. Mr. Nardone? Here. Mr. Brogna is absent. Mrs. McCurdy is absent. Mr. Swank is absent. Is Ms. Haddox on the phone today? There was no. Ms. Haddox is absent. Mr. Macri? Present. So individual committees do not have to do roll call. We're starting tonight with the Financial Planning Committee. Mr. Nardone. So we'll be looking to uh, uh, approve the minutes of March 9th of the Financial Planning <coughs> Committee. Could you speak in a microphone, please? Yes, we'll be looking to approve the minutes of March 9th. Financial Planning Committee. Uh, let's also let the record reflect that Ms. Campbell has arrived. You need it. I'll make a motion. Hmm. No motion. Is there a second? I need a second. All in favor? All in favor? All in favor? Aye. And I'll be looking to uh, seeking approval of the items one, two, and three. To the April 20th meeting. Are there any questions uh, from the board? Any questions? Oh, go ahead. Uh, item three, I'm assuming that's for the 2023 20, 24 school year. I, yes. Yes, it is. Any questions from the public? Questions from the public? Okay, we're looking for a motion to move these forward. So, so move. Motion. Second. Sec Anybody? Second. Second. It's all in favor. All in favor? Aye. Now we'll have a um, event. Yep. Thank you. Presentation. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Benz. I'm the kind of the budget person here at Crosswood. Uh, the last presentation I made was in February. I'm going to give an update now. And what we'll do is I'll give an update on where our budget gap is, revenue versus expense. I'll explain what things happened since February to, to move that gap. Um, then I'll talk about what the remaining items are in timeline. Um, at that point, the rest of the presentation is really going to be a shift towards a discussion on property tax increases and what they represent in revenue to the district, um, what it means to individual taxpayers with homes of different values, comparisons to other districts, both in the, in the county and across the state. So in February, I presented a budget gap of $2.7 million. Now here we are in April, and the, the gap has grown to $2.8 million. 
Now that doesn't seem like a lot in either direction. However, there was a lot of movement since then with different line items that resulted in the hundred million, or excuse me, the hundred thousand dollars additional gap. And that's what I'll discuss on this slide. So starting on the left, the, the positive changes that occurred since February is the earned income tax that the district receives from the local taxpayers is trending higher um, for a long enough period of time that we felt comfortable with adjusting that line item up a bit from where we added in in February. Um, the state subsidies, uh, as you probably all know, in March, the governor put out his, his budget is um, not, not a final budget, but a recommended budget. And that includes specific dollar amounts for what districts will get with special education, basic <coughs> education funding, and then a new revenue source that may or may not happen that could, could help. So we should talk a little bit about this one because I know a lot of people are anxious to see how this may change things and how we would handle it. So what we, because it was, the, the increase year over year was more similar to the increase we saw last year compared to the previous, which is a little higher than the typical trend for the last five or six years. But because it's a preliminary budget, we had to make a decision as to how much we wanted to bake into the budget, knowing that there's certainly a chance that could change and there's history suggesting that it does change. And there's already a lot of articles out there, both from both sides of the aisle, about how it should change. The right side, as we talked about, is suggesting the total pie should get smaller. The left side suggesting the allocation should get shifted to favor more urban districts and potentially hurt districts like Crestwood. So we didn't feel comfortable putting all, at all in this budget. What we put in was, for the uh, special education funding, we put in 75% of what the, the governor had in his budget. Basic education, we put 50%. If we get lucky and the state passes the budget in June before we have to pass our budget, we could plug in real numbers there. But um, lacking that unlikely outcome or real strong guidance that's kind of consensus across the state, that number's probably not going to move much more between now and us finalizing the budget. Um, next item is support staff attrition. When I built the budget way back in October, November, initially, you know, all the individual employees are loaded in there. And we do have a fair amount of turnover within our support staff. And as people leave and new people come in, they come at different wage points. So I went in and cleaned that up and chewed it up to see where we landed. And that did help the budget just a bit. Our teacher comp time, that continues to trend year over year positively from a, a budget perspective. So uh, we reduced that, um, I think, by about 50000 we, the, the, the deadline for teacher retirements was March 1st. So we now have those names and we can look at exactly what the, the severance costs are associated with those people, and build that in the budget, which, which I did. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, a little out of order. The severance change I have in the top right, because I actually had under budgeted that a little bit. So that, that hurt the budget just a bit. But the retiree backfill, once we knew who they really were, Administration was able to look at it and say, well, this retiree we don't have to backfill for, this one we have to backfill for it. So we have that chewed up in there. That ended up being a positive. We, if you remember back in November, I had mentioned that the subsidy for transportation is one of the more difficult items for us to budget, to predict what it's going to be. But as you get closer to June, you get more guidance, you have more data, you can get more accurate. I had that in there at 1.35 million. We increased it to 1.5 million. So that helped a bit. And then this next one looks like a positive, but you need to put that in context. I have been talking about how we had $1.2 million budgeted in this fiscal year for COVID revenue, and we we're going to use 1.4 next year and about 400,000 in 24, 25. We did make an uh, increase to next year's budget, pulling that 200 of the 424, 25 back into 23, 24. So while that helps us in this budget, it hurts us next year. So it's a trade-off there. So those were all the positives. On the negative side, we did have to increase the charter school um, cost a bit. That's still trending a little bit higher. And then it, once again, the third one's the big one on this slide. Our healthcare actuals are now, for 22-23, are now running $1.5 million over budget, trended out over 12 months. So while that affects not only our cash flow for this year, it also impacts our rates for next year. Because you know we are 
um, self-insured and future rates are based on the, the history, most specifically most recent history. So there was an adjustment there that frankly ate up a lot of the stuff on the left. Um, lane, lane movement increase, what I mean there is for our teachers as they earn additional educational credits, they're move, able to move left to right in their metrics and earn extra compensation. Um, there was a, more classes being approved that I had assumed when I originally built the budget. So there was a small adjustment made there. And then I have maintenance capital increase. As you all know, and so I see a lot of people who work here know that we had trouble with the, the sewer here and there's um, issues with roofs at the elementary school. So we spent some money uh, on maintenance this year that's gonna be gone. So we needed to put a little on the side for next year as well. We don't know what's gonna happen. And we're not talking about millions of dollars to, to go buy new shiny things. This is stuff to keep the lights on and keep the schools open, to have some protection for whatever pops up next year, which we sure, there'll be something. What it's gonna be, we don't know. But we felt we needed to have a, you know, some couple bucks set aside. Here. <coughs> so I'm gonna stop at this point and ask if there's any questions. And also take a drink. No? Okay. So what do we have left between now and June? Um, we have been trying to renegotiate anything we related to health care costs, whether it's with our primary insurance carriers, the healthcare brokers, pharmaceuticals, stop loss carriers. That's continuing. Um, we've been having discussions with the bargaining units. Um, obviously the property tax consideration which will be the big theme of this presentation. Furlough considerations. Um, the Crestwood Cyber Academy, actually the last three. The Crestwood Cyber Academy advertising and building blocks are areas that could generate additional revenue for the district at some point. Probably not soon enough to help with next year's budget, but maybe the year after. So I just want <coughs> people to be aware that that's being worked on. And then we have the outside influencers. We talked about the state subsidy. We'll continue to monitor what we hear and what any of our state reps may tell us about what they think is going to happen with that preliminary budget. And we'll keep an eye on that earned income tax. And hopefully it continues to trend better, um, but frankly, it could trend worse too. So that could go either way. Uh, there's nothing any of us could do about that other than watch it and adjust. Okay. So where does that leave us right now? We have a $2.8 million gap. And we kind of have three areas to try to fill it that we just talked about. The two big ones, of course, are potential property tax increase, second one, staff reductions, and then the third one being if we get lucky on any of those other things on the previous page, which frankly are probably not going to be large enough to solve a whole lot. And really, it could go both ways, too. But it's something that we can't ignore, um, and we will keep an eye on. So to quantify that, and this has all been presented um, in previous presentations, but the question comes up is, you know, 1% tax increase, what does that actually represent in revenue to the district? It's about $230,000. And what's the value of the furlough? Well, for the members of the CEO, um, per furlough would be about $103,000 expense savings in 23-24. That number seems a little light to you. Um, it's, it's probably because when you do a furlough, you have to also budget the unemployment comp that the district has to pay when they're gone for, for one year. Um, after that, that, that expense will go away. So that's where we are. So from a timeline perspective, where do we go from here? Well, in May, a uh, proposed final budget needs to be presented and approved by the board. That budget is non-binding, and it does not need to be balanced. Um, but it does need to be admit, available for public review for 30 days. It'll be on both the district website and in the business office. And then come June, a final budget needs to be passed, which is binding and must be balanced. So that's the budget timeline. From a expectation, I see Mr. Darwin's here and he was very disappointed I wasn't here last month to present. I want to set an expectation going forward um, for me. I will probably do a presentation in May, but I would expect it to be light. Today's is pretty meaty, frankly, but next month I'm not expecting there to be too much. So it'll probably be very quick. I may give an update on our um, third party audit that has now been finalized and um, filed with the state. I'll give some highlights from that. As a preview, I'll tell you it was clean, but there's a lot more detail we could discuss if the board wants me to, to do that in May. And then in, in June, um, we'll see. In June, probably a little more. Okay. All right, on to property tax increase. We know 5.1 
is the highest this, the district is, or the board is allowed to go um, per state law. Of course, if they don't increase it at all, there's no extra revenue to the district. A 2.5% tax increase would be worth about 570000 3% about 700, four and a quarter approaching a million, and 5.1 will max out approaching 1.2 million. So that's as high as they could possibly go. That doesn't mean they will go to 5.1 or that they would do zero, but just to put it in financial context for you, that's what the tax increase represents in revenue to the district with their goal of um, filling that $2.8 million gap. Questions here? <coughs> Okay, from a historical perspective, uh, I don't have trouble seeing all on this one. This shows the property tax, both the, the real estate mills and the year over year increase going back from 16 and 17 through 22, 23. And you'll see that <clears throat> the, the yellow line graph, that's your year over year increase. And it, it jumped around a little. Um, the bar graphs, as you'd expect, would go up you know, a little year, at least most years, to show our mill. So that's just a quick historical view. So what that means in dollars to a homeowner historically, let's, and there's, there's a lot of graphs and there's some eye charts coming up. I'm not going to go through every number on them, but I'm just going to explain what type of information is on the slide. When Damien gets that presented on the district site tomorrow, you can go and hash it and check my math and email me if you see anything wrong. But let's stick with the $400,000 home example. Um, from, this is just school taxes. From a school tax perspective, a four hundred thousand dollar home in two thousand eighteen nineteen, um, the, the homeowner would have to pay forty one hundred or forty one fifty. And you fast forward to twenty two twenty three, that's up to forty eight thirteen. It's about a seven hundred dollar increase during that time frame. That makes sense to everyone. What I'm trying to show. So this is one that's definitely an art chart, and this shows. I'm um, using the same percentages that I showed on the previous slide. If the board is going to increase taxes by zero, two and a half, three, four and a quarter, five point one, what that increase would be. So sticking with, say, the, the four hundred thousand dollar home, which is the matrix on the bottom left, um, at three percent increase, that would mean a hundred forty five dollar increase um, for the homeowner. And you know, all the other numbers are there for you to look at. So everyone follow that. All right, this next one is even, probably even a worse of an eye chart, but the questions come in a couple times. And on the previous slide, I just showed the school taxes. I know homeowners, property owners say, yeah, well, that's just the impact from the school, but there's also county taxes, there's local taxes. Why don't you show an all-in view? So that's what this, this slide intends to do. Same thing, $400,000 home, if you have a 0%, 2, 3, 4 and a quarter, 5, 1 school tax increase, What's the total impact to the $400,000 or whatever home? So in that case, you're going to get a higher number. I'm using my 3% example. Now you're looking at a $218 increase. So how did I do that? Well, the county already announced that they're increasing property taxes by 2.99%. So that's baked in here. The municipals, they're all different. The nine municipalities in the district, they all have different um, mortgage rates and tax rates. So what? seven of them didn't change year over year. Two did. Wright Township increased, but it was by voter referendum. Whitehaven increased, but it was because they, they took over the, the garbage, um, the private garbage service, and that bill no longer needs to be paid by the homeowners. So frankly, I just ignored those, because they, they weren't typical increases that just kind of get imposed. There was nuances to them. So I left them out, but the, you could see um, what the increase would be from an all-in perspective. Questions? Again, there's a lot of numbers and it's an eye chart, but it's really meant to be a reference slide more than anything. Okay, um, slides like this have been presented in the past where it compares Crestwood's millage to the other, uh, the millage of the other dist er districts in the county. For a long time, we were far right. We were lowest in the county. We're not anymore. We're still, you know, on the lower end. We're th right now, we're third from the, from the lowest, looking at it strictly from the millage perspective. I mean, where are we on average property value? Because millage is directly related to the property value. It is. I don't know where we are in average property values. I can't give you that number, but I could give you a different metric that considers that point very directly. Um, and this is property tax per pupil. So 
if you look at the all the revenue generated by property taxes, and that and John's point and a lot of people's point is, yeah, if you look just look at millage, but property taxes are higher in Mount Cox, you're generating a lot more money. So you shouldn't compare it that way. And I always say to that, we'll finish the thought. How are you really going to compare it to other districts? We have to normalize it somehow because you can't compare all of our revenue to Wilkes-Barre or Hazleton because they're so much larger. So you need to normalize it by dividing by something. I like to divide it by pupil. Property tax revenue per pupil. And you can see in that case, John, that takes to the point of the assessments. You can see we come right dead center in the middle, which would imply the property tax revenue that's being generated for the school is neither high nor low in this county uh, compared to other districts. I don't have a slide for it, but I looked at that at the state <clears throat> level too. 500 districts in the state, we were 250. So we're right dead center in the middle, whether you look at it locally or statewide. So this is, I've never seen anyone else present it that way, but to me that always made sense. So I threw it out there, you guys could, you know, ignore it or consider it, but I thought it was salient to the show. Barry, were you gonna say something? Okay. All right, so the appendices, this one you've seen before, I've had this in here really as a reference just for questions. Um, this one has changed. As I mentioned early in the presentation, uh, the 2324 had been showing 1.4 million until this month. Now we have that up to 1.6. But in 2425, that used to say 440,000. Now it says 240. So again, it helps in 2324, but we're going to feel it in 2425. Yep. What's the balance, please, of the ESER fund? Uh, a rough estimate's be, fine. We'll let him spend uh, two days. Yeah, so we submitted the April submission today, assuming that's approved, which is expected. The remaining balance would be simply what's in 23 and 24, which would be about 1.8 million. Okay, what's the balance available for 22? So 23, 24, starting J July 1st? We plan on spending 1.6 million in 23, 24. So the total that would be there would be 1.8, that's outstanding. Right. Whether we'd be eligible to receive it all in that year with expenses, we don't know that for sure. Do you have the option for no cost extension from 24 to 25? We could. Of the remaining $200,000, you said you're planning on spending 1.6. Right, are you saying pull the 200 back or push more forward? I'm asking what you're doing with the 200,000. You said that you budgeted for 23, 24, 1.6 million. Correct. Okay, what happens to the, the 200000 Is that for the rest of this year, or does that get... No, that goes in 24 25 Okay, so there is, that's called a no-cost extension. Until no, we have until September 30th, 2025 to submit. 24, I'm sorry. Okay, and what what is the planned use of those funds? Is that what you're going to go into? Um, I'm not the one to answer. You are a business manager, right? You said, no, I'm not. I'm a volunteer, but the... How the spends are, are, are the funds are spent, that's more of an administrative question. So, but you're the business manager and you're getting health benefits. So, I'm just wondering who's budgeting the, the 1.8 million? I'm budgeting, it, but, but deciding what it's being spent on is done by the educators. Okay, so that has not been factored into the 2324 budget. Or, yeah, the 2324 budget. 1.6 million has, yeah. It has, and what's it going to be used for? So again, I, 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 I'll share that with you. It's on our website. We did a presentation in January for the community. Um, I can get that. We can email it to you if you leave your contact with Ms. Otero. Yeah. But we did provide a presentation as part of our requirements for federal programming. Um, just off the top of my head, I'll share a few of them. It's, um, they're broken down into learning loss. Um, it's also broken down to a social worker, social studies teacher, business teacher, comp time. Those are just some quick highlights, but we did go over it in January, and if you want to leave your email, mm -hmm. you can do that, or you can find it on the website. Okay, well, I have some other issues to address later on, but I'll just say right now, the transparency with the CSD website is pretty poor right now. All of the 2023 uh, board meeting minutes are not there, not available. Only a few of the 2023 agendas have been posted for um, beginning in January of 2023. Um, there are budgets missing from I don't know how many years. So there's a lot of information missing, and, and the public would like some transparency around these issues. So really getting Stephanie in there and working on that website, getting all of that information made available to the public so we can make sense of these numbers would be really helpful, and I'd appreciate it. Thanks. You <coughs> it, it is on the website. You have to press the tab. To, we, to go we into Google Docs, I understand that. Go. No, no, no. You're talking about the minutes first? Mm -hmm. 
you have to press the tab, mm -hmm. then go into it, and then you have to press the other tab, and it drops down all the minutes. We talked about it last board meeting. They are on. Okay, well, I have my laptop. I'll pull it up. Thank you. Any other questions on this slide? Okay, so this is a, a, a new slide that probably I should have had this in earlier, and it's a reflection on what's gone on with the FISER contributions that impact every district in the state, not just Cressler. And going back to 2003, at that time, the, the amount that the district had to contribute, it was only 0.6%. We're now up to the point where we have to, net of what we get reimbursed, it's up to 17%. And that puts a lot of pressure on every district, including us. So it did drop a little bit for this year, but I'm not expecting it to, to drop materially going forward. And the state has guided us that it won't. I mean, what's the 17% of, or the 17 cent percent of what? The uh, salary plus any stipends or you know, anything that's weight considered. So weight. total income for the year. Yes. Correct. Times 17. For, for every every employee other than subs. Times 17%. Correct. <coughs> okay, and I think this might be my last slide. But this ties again to the PISA situation. It ties into this, this presentation related to property taxes. Now this is a metric across the state. And if you look from the 10 year period from 10-11 to 2021, and you look at it, there was $3.4 billion collected in property taxes. And then if you look at the local share of PISAs plus charter tuition, how much that ate up of that property tax increase in the small bar graph in blue is what the local districts are left with. So that makes it especially tough. Okay, there's one more slide. Salary distribution by category for within the total budget. This is something um, that's been seen in the past. Obviously, the, the largest spend for salaries is with the CEA at just 15, a little over 15 million. Support staff comes in at 2.7, admin at 1.3, co-curricular little shy of 500 and confidential secretary, secretaries, a little over 900,000. And then you can see the average salaries listed. And John, to your point, that salary listed there is all in. So that includes stipends, comp time, um, cyber coaching, everything, o overtime for support staff. It's not a base salary number, it's an all so in. Number. That's the number the state uses to basically back bill us the 17% for, for the back bill. Yeah. It's an all in number. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? So, so who is the business manager of the school district? I'll let Natasha answer that one. So, um, the board had a, I don't remember what month it was, but a couple months ago, we have a, a business consultant. Um, it's, it's from School Business, that's the name of it, consultant. His name is Joe Caputo. Um, so we contract with him, and then specifically the conversations with him plus uh, Tommy Benz together. We, we don't have a dedicated business manager, but we do have two people that are working together for budgeting um, in that process. So why isn't, why isn't Mr. Caputo giving the, the budget presentation? Because Tommy's his part of his function is the budget. So he fo fully focuses on our budget with the business consultant, but Tommy has been doing all of our budget presentations since October? November. November, so he's been doing that. So I could volunteer to give Mr. Caputo's budget presentation? No, it's not Mr. Caputo's budget presentation. This is Tommy Benz's presentation to the board of directors on the budget. That's really confusing. Is Tommy or Mr. Benz a 1099 employee? No, I'm a volunteer. How, how does Mr. How is the school Whatever this rule is, how are the health insurance benefits funded? Is it funded through the union contract or is it funded as a 1099 employee? Neither. I think Mr. Dean knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, so just so you know, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, specifically the regulations that could be filed found in Section 2000, I think, JII title. 2000. That's the, that's the section. JII. Okay. It's definitely Section 2000. I may be wrong on the subheadings. Uh, of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Fair Labor Standards yep. Act specifically provides the method for a volunteer for a public entity. Secondly, under United States Treasury regulations, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Benz, or any volunteer, not, I don't mean to single out Mr. Benz. Any of Benz, us could do it, yes. Any volunteer is, has the ability to receive group health insurance. So that's blessed by the federal government. I spoke to the federal government to ensure that I read the regs 
correctly, uh, United States Treasury, as well as the Fair Labor Standards Act. Okay. So Mr. Benz's qualifications are impeccable. Uh, I don't care about his qualifications. Let, 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 let me, let me finish. Let me, and, and secondly, uh, I've worked with Mr. Caputo yes. ad hoc in other districts. He does a fantastic job for his role. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, if, and I've interviewed business managers for many other districts, including Crestwood, is that a, a business manager of Mr. Benz's qualifications or similar qualifications would cost the district between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars all in. So I think we're getting a bargain here. No, that's absolutely not true in terms of what a business manager is paid on average for a public school district in the United States. You're talking about qualifications in the private sector versus school <coughs> no, business. No, I, I disagree with ma'am. That salary is not correct. Ma'am, ma'am, you I can check the Bureau of Labor I, statistics on that. Ma'am, I'm not talking about private industry. Public school districts in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Are paid 150 for, to 200 thousand dollars. No, I said all in. That includes benefits. Typically, for example. Uh, uh, the business manager, the Mahanoy Area School District, budget seventeen million dollars. His salary is one hundred eighteen dollars, one hundred eighteen thousand dollars plus benefits. So that takes him to probably one sixty, one seventy in a seventeen million dollar district. Uh, the business manager, when Mr. Malone was here, uh, and I've always been a fan of Mr. Malone. I know some out there are not. Uh, he was at one hundred and twenty five with no benefits, I believe. So you need to check public school districts in. Northeastern Pennsylvania, specifically IU 19. Grant Palfi out in Dallas, very good business manager. Uh, we work a lot with him. He bounces ideas off Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz bounces ideas off him. Mr. Palfi's probably hey, all in. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, but I want to get back to. I'm oh, asking, you're. Right. I, I just want. I just to, want to ask specific questions. I'm asking: Is his group health insurance a part of the union's group health insurance plan, or is it single funded? It's part, no, 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 it has to be the group plan. It is part of the group plan. He receives the teacher's benefits. He receives his administration benefits. He receives the same health benefits as administration receives, as contract employees receive, and as the teachers receive. Okay, so I'm just going to say from an actuarial standpoint, mm -hmm. the risk involved with hiring a person of that age with whatever qualifications he claimed to have here as a volunteer for $1 would have been far more beneficial to pay him a salary than to pay for his health benefits under the group plan. And you are you are claiming that the health benefits are a big part of the budgetary problems. Not you specifically. This board is claiming that health insurance increases are a big part of this problem. I realize he's one person of many and N of one does not make that big of an impact, but it does make an impact. And the same person who's receiving that benefit is also budgeting for the district. That to me is a very clear conflict conflict of interest. Well, it's no different than any other business manager who budgets for district who's an employee of the district. But they're a business manager who was hired on the up and up through a board action who was who was reviewed for... He was prior. hired through yeah, a board yeah, action. He was yeah. hired through board action. And I, 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 I ma'am, no ad hominem attacks on up and up. Mr. Benz was on the agenda. I mean, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's just be clear. He receives the, the same benefits as the administration Correct. does. Okay. Correct. Correct. No, that's not true. Oh, just right. health care. There's no retirement benefits or yeah. anything like that. Right. No PCRs, no anything like that. Okay. So, okay, I'll save the rest of my questions until there's okay, a thank you. question. Okay, thank you. And you could call me or email me or, or meet with me afterwards. See, I don't think that's appropriate to meet afterwards or post it later or do this because it never circles well, back and there's not transparency. I'm, I, I stay here. You could, I'm here all day, nine hours. You can come meet me anytime. He'd be after here, but we don't want to tie up a public meeting over whether Mr. Benz's qualifications and what he's getting paid. Okay, fair enough. Any questions about the presentation of the budget? Bob? <coughs> um, two things. One, uh, with health care running so hot, um, what does the, do you have an idea what the fund balance projection will look like when this budget cycle ends? Well, it's budgeted to be between <coughs> half a million and a million. Where it's actually going to land, I don't know for sure. I'm trying to get, get a, trying to get that quantified a little tighter is something that we're looking to do over the next few weeks, but I would expect it to be under half a million. Um, 
right. Second question. Because remember, there's a lot of cost-saving measures that were put in place to counteract the situation. The second question, the $200,000 that you're robbing Peter to pay Paul this year, all right? Your problem really is a two-year problem. So what's what's the scope, what's the what's the two-year budget gap? Because you're, you're, you're bringing $200,000 from you know, two years down in, you know, into, into next year, and I, I know there's a problem out there waiting, and, and we just made that there, problem the two hundred thousand dollars work. Until we know what's going to happen with tax increases this year, what the state does this year, and what happens with furloughs this year, can't really give that. Where, give, where does it stand right now if nothing changes? Must, you know, yeah, I, 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 I can't answer. You'd that. have to assume a tax increase rate. <clears throat> yeah. You'd have to assume other cost savings measures. And then just stipulate this is what it's based off of, and all of those are variations that aren't determined because they have to happen through board action over the next two months. I would expect to be standing here again in January showing a gap, but how big it's going to be, I don't know. All right. Well, the, the COVID money that's that's going to be, what will the COVID money that will be left over be bu budgeted for that budget cycle? That's that's how much. That's the one. We'll have 1.6 for next year, 200 for the year after that. 200, 200 for the year after that. Yeah, rounding. But yeah. So, over the both years, it's it's really one one point. That money was spent for. I, I know I, I know that it's it's supposed to be earmarked for certain things, but I feel the money the money was you, know, you spent money that you didn't have. Can I speak to that point? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so I analyzed the every single set of minutes and I've watched all the board meetings online since since 2015. Basically from 2015 until 2017, the district took out $10.4 million in bonds um, between refis and general bond obligations. $5.274 million and I have every single item accounted for for that field house in this calculation, I know you said it's 3.9, I have the receipts, it's $5.274 million for the field house, the bonds were taken for it. The remaining of the $10.4 million was $5.135 uh, million for non-field house expenses. These are our general obligation bonds, that $10.4 million went to it. I have handouts if anyone wants it. 58% of the $10.4 million that was taken out in those three years was spent on sports, including the field house. You're telling me that a public school district spent 58% of its debt on a field house and 20% on, on other buildings. And I mean, where's the, um, and I wasn't on the board back then, but just recollecting, where was the um, HVAC upgrade that was put in under the Co stars or just general upgrades? The, the Coast Guards. Okay, the Coast Stars thing happened in 2019. Basically, what we did is we refined our entire debt in 2019, Jack. Yeah, <laughs> the, the I have year, it all I, right I, here. I'm sure you're right on the year. I'm I know, honest. I know. Isn't that crazy that someone in the public had to dig through all this to find it? But anyway, well, it was, I'm sorry, but the years fly by. So in, let's see. October of 2019, the entire debt was refined at $19.5 million. So that included approximately $8 million for Siemens. For the Siemens. For the project upgrade. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Between the three number, schools. I can't, I don't necessarily agree with the numbers, all the other numbers, but the $8 million, I definitely agree with. Yes. It's $8 million for Siemens. So, so what was the question? Because there, there, so, so basically the culmination of these different bonds. So how could, I, I guess what I'm, I'm asking again, yeah. and I certainly enjoyed the conversation. So if $8 million, give or take, was spent on the HVAC upgrades on the buildings, mm -hmm. and how much on the field house? Uh, that was $5,274,481. So just my simple math, $8 million is more than $5 million, so how could the... Five million be fifty-eight percent of the bond money. No, no, the bonds taken. A bond was taken. If you want to jot this down, but I have handouts for after seven point two million dollars in November of twenty fourteen. A general bond obligation and refinance of the current debt. We were going into fiscal year fourteen or academic fourteen 
with a, an obligation, a refi bond in debt service total of $7.3 million, essentially. March of 2015, we took a $6 million bond. March of 2017, we took a $4.5 million bond. That was the bond for the field, supposedly. In September of 2017, an additional $950,000 bond was taken. $950,000 plus $4.5 million is going to get you to the 5.27 score and change for the field house. Okay. Okay. So when you add up that those initial bonds, you come to 11 point, almost $5 million. What I did is I... So what happened to the $8 million for the... Fast forward to 2019, what they did is they refied the 11 point almost For at a cheaper million. rate or at a higher rate? I, Tom? It was part of the scoop and pass. Scoop and pass. Was it at right. a higher rate or not? Because the interest rates were... It had to be because our bond rating had dropped at that point. Yeah, and it, it was a little higher. The blended <coughs> rate is still very low. Okay, so we took the hit on the interest rate and we took more debt um, for something that was promised in this very room. I'm not... I'm not be dazzled by what the heck happened with Siemens, but that's another. another right, that, that's actually another issue because we still have HVAC issues in our buildings. It didn't exactly. fix everything. So yeah. that even if that was a great investment, it wasn't a great investment because we still to, to this week we had issues in our in our Fairview buildings for heating and air conditioning yeah. that we're still trying to resolve. So we took eleven million dollars. We added another eight million dollars. We increased our interest rate, and that will put us at twenty-seven. Point nine, I mean, twenty-seven point nine million million um, in total debt from the $19.5 million uh, refi in addition to the bonds, okay? So I think it's time to draw the line in this district about why we are where we are. There's no need to Monday morning quarterback everything if you don't have the facts, but the facts clearly show that we have spent so much money on the field house and non-educational expenses ma'am i'm still you need to dumb it down for me we spent eight million dollars on hvac they spent five million dollars six million dollars whatever that number is on a field house mm -hmm. right eight million is still more than six million okay so you're saying after after you add the eight million dollars what is the percent right we're looking back in time you got to add in anything you can't just pick and choose what you want to add in there and we're also no, 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 we're no. picking on stuff that's already come and gone. No, this board has no way of affecting that those decisions no, back the, in time. The board does have a way of changing this going forward and I have a couple of suggestions related to that in just a moment. I was saying the percent of total expenditures from 2015 to 2017 of the bonds that were drawn from 2014 through 2017 was 58% okay. dedicated to sports. For that period of time. Yes. Jack, can you confirm something for me? Yes. Debt service. Where does that get paid from? What part of the, the I could district? Answer that. That's general fund. Yeah, so all the expenses right. that, that you just mentioned are capital expenses, of course. Yeah. The debt service gets paid out of the operating budget. It's $1.9 million, about 4% mm -hmm. of this total budget. Um, our debt service as a percentage of the total operating budget is 4%, as I said. The average in the state is 14%. It our, depends on the year. It, it may vary a little bit. But across the five, I forget which year I looked at. I'm assuming 20. I have 22. the debt service for every single year going back, except for, all, for the two years that for all 500 years. districts. Yeah. And so, so, so for it should be four percent here. It's two. It's it's approximately two million. No, as a percentage of the operating budget. Okay. So here's the thing: you took from 2014 to 2017 bonds totally almost $11 million. You spent 58% on sports in the field house, okay? But again, we spent $8 million on infrastructure. Stop. I'm, I'm trying to help people understand how we got here. You created an inordinate amount of debt service because of ballooning payments and a whole host of reasons. And then, and then you stepped into it when you went to 2019 and refied at a higher rate and added more debt to a company that didn't do very productive things. We'll just leave it at that. So my point is, is that 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 58% went to sports and we have to pay debt service on the loans that we took to pay for all of those things that went to sports. Where does the debt service come from? The general fund. Guess what? In 2014, this 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 is
is what blew my mind here. We started in actually academic year ending 6-30-2016, $6.1 million was in the unassigned general fund balance. Okay? Then it goes down to 4.8. And then it creeps down. But, but the capital budget's in a restricted fund. It wouldn't be included. Your in debt numbers. service, the bonds you took to pay, even if it's for the capital things, if they're general obligation bonds, have to be paid from the general fund, which is now the debt service does. But when you listed the six million dollar number or whatever you stated, you ignored the restricted account. That's where all that's where the capital funds are. You have you had to pay for those expenditures with debt, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And you have to pay the debt service on. Yes, and and the debt service comes from the general fund. Mm -hmm. And you started with six point one million dollars, and you came to twenty twenty three with a measly eight hundred sixty seven thousand dollars. This is we because agree, we have agree, invested agree in the wrong this, places in this four, district. Four percent of our budget mm -hmm. for debt service is extremely low compared to other districts. That isn't the problem with our operating budget. So you're saying we went from six point one million to eight hundred sixty-seven thousand in terms of our fund balance, and our debt service was five hundred ninety-eight thousand when we started out with that first seven point two million dollar bond, and last year it was two point four million dollars, and Somehow we're out of money, and the debt service comes from the general fund. So you're, you're saying there's there's a complete disconnect there. What I'm saying is the needs. No, of I'm asking yes or no. Is there a disconnect there? Am I am I? He's incorrect? allowed to answer the question. Okay, we're allowing you to. Speak. Okay, go ahead. Let him answer. Yes. What I'm saying is the needs of this district. We have. I showed a slide on it. I had a three pan slide. We have capital needs. We have to try to get the fund balance built back up, and we have to get revenues to balance the expenses. So with the capital needs, the way districts address that is through floating bonds. What they should be used for is up to the wisdom of the board. But I can tell you from a financial perspective, debt service as a percentage of our operating budget for this school district is very low. But it, you could it, judge, you could, you could have mm -hmm. your own opinions on the wisdom of what it was spent on. We could agree, we could disagree, whatever. But looking at it strictly financially, the debt service on a $50 million budget being under $2 million is extremely low. And that is your opinion. The facts show. It's the opinion of the external auditors, too. The facts show that we have a measly fund balance. We have a debt service that has to come from that fund. And we have spent a lot of money on the field house and some other expenses that were not focused on education. So let's, let's just leave it at that and let me step forward. Now, I, I want people to understand. And be clear, we are in the situation that we were, we are in because of of it's not because of debt. I'll never agree with that. Okay, our, well our that's right. I'm never going to agree that it's not because of debt and because of the Taj Mahal. Okay. Right. We, have so, a question over here. Matt, we have a question over here. So yeah. I think the moral of the story and what has been expressed in previous meetings as well is that we want a long term solution and. Mm -hmm. I really don't get a feel for any of that. Like, where are we headed for the future? Is it going to be continued with how, you know, she's talking about there's a bigger priority on some things that a lot of people don't necessarily agree with? Or is there some sort of plan? I, I'm not comfortable with the plan. Well, there is no plan for, for getting back on our feet and getting back to where we need to be. And, and honestly, that, that's what we're struggling with. And we do agree. I mean, I don't think there's a person on this board that doesn't want a long-term plan. And that's, we've months now been talking about how do we move forward, because things are horrible. Like, you said they don't look good. They're horrible. I, I mean, they really are. And I mean, I, I was against the field house. I know there's other people on this board that were against the field house. Many of us are in the sucky position we're in sitting on this board because of that stupid field house. So I mean, I'm not arguing with you with that at all, but there's a lot of things I wish I could go back in time and change, but none of us have the authority to do that. So right now, you know, but I agree with you, we have to have a long-term plan. We have to, there hasn't been one, and that's what we're we're trying to figure out. And, you know, I mean, there, you know, Rick, go ahead, like, I mean, there, there's options for long-term plan, some are bad, some are worse. And I mean, I hate to say it, but 
Can I can I give an example? Of taxes, not, and raising taxes, raising taxes is obvious. I mean, everything goes up. Grocery store goes up. Everything goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want a fair law teachers? That's going to correct this policy. Let's say we correct the problem right now, immediately. What's for next year? What's for five right. years? What's Agreed. for ten years? Right. Where's the numbers? Well, but I mean, and, and I mean that's, and I agree with, I agree with what I mean, they're saying. We can't have a strict budget in two, three years to figure out. Well, you but, but you're right, it's bad because next there's, year there's we know we're losing 1.6 million right off the bat. That was on the chart. We know that's gone. We know there'll be salary increases next year, so we know that's going up. The way this health insurance is going, it's going to be even higher next year. I, I don't see how we're going to continue to afford this. So no, things, things are bad, and I, you know, there's a point where. In, in my mind, where's the line too that we're hurting the kids? You know, where's the point that it's better to let the state come in and just fix everything? Because we're gonna hurt the kids worse than the state is. And that's a discussion we've had. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying that's what we should do, but it's discussions we've had because things are not good. Can I just, I did not come. The, the lady in the back's been trying for a while. I just have a question. Um, when I went here, there were a bunch of homes from the entrance down going towards McDonald's, and I know the guy bought it and demolished them. Can we look at selling those to bring in revenue? Which that that will improve the tax revenue also because land is sitting there and has to be cut, but there could be homes on them generating more revenue. That was one of my thoughts for generating revenue. I would just like to say a couple of things. The way the structure is set up, where <coughs> There's new people on this on the board every few years. Um, as an elected official, and people that run for boards may not have what it really takes to look at long-term strategic planning. Not dismissing their intellect or their experience. But if we put, and I thought I wanted to do that, let's put a long-term plan together to improve the financial stability for the next five to seven years. We can do that. We can do that. I know how to do that. But the board's going to change in a couple of years. People are going to come in. No, not a couple of years. A couple of months. And a couple. Of, it's going to change. But it will be it's in a couple of months, even if change. this plan gets approved. And someone asked at the last session that we had a great, really uh, good discussion about long-term planning. How do you long-term plan when we've had three superintendents? I'm on the board. It's my fourth year. Three superintendents and three business managers. I don't have the answer to that. I didn't get elected to sit here and just work on replacing people. We wanted to make a long-term plan in a pandemic. So, uh, and you know, so now I think what happens is when you're in crisis and this take school board out of it, just put it in your house. If you have no money to spend, you're trying to serve the immediate needs or or whatever the crisis is. And if if two people in the house don't agree on it, which is also <laughs> not happening here in the community, it's the teacher contract fault. It's escalating healthcare fault. It's long-term debt problems. I could argue that none of that long-term debt was spent well, because Siemens isn't. We have no energy efficiency that we're proving out of the Siemens deal, and our, our board president subsequent to that wanted to extend that contract. And thank God we voted that down. It was an extension of the contract and a rollover of the debt that was supposed to save us money. Siemens never delivered on what they've done on that debt. We haven't even had that open conversation. So there's so many different challenges, but to go forward, you'd have to have like a long-term continuity plan in the board president, the superintendent, a business manager that's not paid. Um, yeah, I don't even know how that would happen. And then clearly you, you can't change the state laws about elections and people staying on the board. So one thing we can do that I'll comment on that. Once decisions are made for this year, whatever they be, and we have that as a baseline, you could put together a potential plan. Whether anyone will listen to it or abide by it, no idea. But to put one together now without knowing what decisions are going to be made in the next couple of months, you're just, you know, put, you know, put your hand in the wind. I, I did come with some solutions, if I may offer them, believe it or not. So I work with PDE almost daily. I understand how funds work. I understand how transfers work. I understand how grants work. I do it all day, every day. I've offered my assistance to this, this di district with grants. I founded the Crestwood Education Foundation and, and got that ball rolling. So let me tell you, after we stepped into the Siemens deal in 2019 and then COVID happened, all of this money has been poured back into grants to provide 
any number of entities with options to address their debt issues, address their energy issues. Because of the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed in November of 2022, the Department of Energy actually put in place uh, a funding opportunity announcement for energy improvements at public K-12 school facilities. Um, unfortunately, the grant was due this month. I'm guessing that no one here was aware of that. What you could have done is you could have gone back to Siemens and said, hey, we paid you $8 million to get us energy efficient. You owe us at least to partner with us on this grant so that we get it and get you know a couple million dollars to at least address some of these infrastructure issues at the school. That's a couple million dollars right there. Wyoming area, I spoke with someone there today. They have their LCC and Lackawanna College folks certified. So they're teaching the kids in the school instead of sending the kids out on a daily basis for dual enrollment. So I would bet, and I haven't had a chance to look because I've been too busy picking at these numbers, that there would be a grant to get K through 12 teachers college certified so that you could bring these kids back into the school and do the dual enrollment from their home school. Um, I filed for that grant, by the way. We have not heard from that. For the Department of Energy or for? Their dual education grant. I did file that for the district. So you're pending notification. That's correct. Okay. Yep. So here's the thing. I take, I have a single after school program, <clears throat> okay? We have a portfolio of grants that supports that over a five year period. I can sit there and use Excel very easily to project a five year budget it's, it's only a couple of million dollars, but that's only one of multi-million dollar grants that I manage. I can project that over five years because I know the PDE funds, I know how they work, I know how, how transports work. You can't tell me that, that we are not capable of doing a five-year budget that we stick to using the baseline amount that you receive in the current year and knowing that there's gonna be a standard deviation of X or Y percent over the subsequent four years of a five-year budget, number one. Number two, you apply for the grants that everyone seems to think that they're out there in the ether and we just can't get them, they're there, okay? And if you get the help that you needed that's offered to you on a volunteer basis and you accept that, it's funny how things change. It's really funny how things change. We don't have to be in this situation. Are we stuck with it now? Yes. Are we stuck with it for the next five years? I bet my life right here and now, we absolutely do not have to be, and there are ways around it. And I came up with just two simple ones right now, and Natasha's already on top of one thing. So, you know, thanks for volunteering, Tommy, but what are you getting us? Transparency. Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Yes, ma'am. I have handouts for anybody that doesn't think that I know what I'm talking about, I've got the handouts. Yes, ma'am. Sorry if it was already stated, but the original number was around 21 at the last meeting, 24 up there. Do we have an approximation of where we're at with those furloughs numbers? It's 21 in the resolution, ma'am. I'm sorry? There's 21 in the resolution okay. that was passed. So that would be the maximum number of furloughs. And when does that have to be That would be the maximum number of economic furloughs. furloughs. And those teachers do have to know by the end of April, is that correct? Uh, furloughs will be notified by the end of April. So we're talking two weeks. And I know how that works with going through all of checkerboarding. So two weeks they would be notified. It'll the plan, if that's the course of action, the notifications would go out by the end of April. When do you get the notification on the dual enrollment? The dual enrollment, the, <coughs> the most uh, that you could go for was $75,000 per district. Total? That's it, yeah. Uh, if you look, it's, if you just search PDE dual credit grant, that's the one I was talking to, the one that I applied for. Um, but that, you, the districts couldn't go over 75000 um, the notification came out in February, and then you had until March, I think it was 17th, to file it. And then they said that we would know by March, and I, I haven't heard anything. I check e-grants all the time. I just checked with our other superintendents to see if they heard anything. So I think just PD is behind. 
Um, we've had a lot of conversation with local legislation about helping us try to get those grants and just if any um, appropriation meetings, just keeping our open dialogue with all of them as well. Um, but it was only 75000 And when I say only, that is a lot of money. Um, and 75000 for salaries and fringes or 75000 for what? It's 75000 It could be used for um, transportation. It could be used for the students. So if we decided to keep the Young Scholars Program and, and the students need transportation, it would be for tuition for the students. It could be for a salary for a teacher. Um, they would need to be certified for that. It also could be for books. So there was a lot of different criteria, um, but it also is done like on a point system. So when you go to look at that, it'll see how it's, it's graded. So based upon the budget, what we asked for, um, what, what kind of program we are currently have, which we have one program now. So schools that don't have that program probably are gonna be higher on the list. Yep. So it just really just depends on how we file. So unfortunately, we, we haven't heard anything yet. And can you tell me the name please again? The, the grant, it's, the it's dual, under PDE dual enrollment grant. Yep, yeah. if you search that, you'll find it there. Thank you. Um, Pam, were you done with your questions? <coughs> with the program with art and library I understand cutting them you're cutting that position that teacher's salary benefits and that probably saves the most money but how much is funded for the actual program like how much in our budget do we spend on our elementary libraries for like supplies is that what you're looking yeah, for like books and to, to fund that program like I don't have that, honestly, that number with you unless maybe one of our principals know what we budget for supplies. Um, it, that strictly would be the savings that were quantified is for the actual reduction of, of the staff member. Right. So we're not saving anything really. The like staff member. The program, just like that staff member's. I don't know what the so supply we're amount is. programs away. I know, I know the position is where the money is. It's the person, is their salary, their benefits. But we're going to remove the program from the kids to just get rid of that one person. Like, is there any way that like, you looked at? Like, is there some way to keep that program? You know, that's all I'm saying. Is like, the program itself does not cost the district that much money aside from the teacher's salary and budget. The PTAs, I know we do like $14,000 we've given to the Rice Library through our book fairs, like it just does, it just seems bad to just take the programs away when it's the position that you're going to save the money. Just something to think about. And same with art, like I, I know my kindergartner brings her art box from her classroom. That's what she used for art supplies in art class. It's her crayon box from her classroom. It's not extravagant paints or clay or expensive materials. It's crayons and pencils that her, is she uses the same ones in her classroom. So I just, maybe we can consider a way to save the program somehow so we're not taking out vacations. Thank you. But if I could share one other thing. Um, so there, the board knows I was going to announce at the next meeting, we, we try to uh, highlight any grants that we receive. One grant we did receive was the FEMA Pima grant. So yes. it was $25,000 um, that was spent throughout this year. Um, we were able to get like garbage bags, hand sanitizers, cleaners. Um, so myself and Tommy worked on that. And we have another meeting for another grant. Again, it's 25000 here. So um, I hear what you're saying on grants. And we applied for a lot of grants. Some have been successful some have not um, but we did just get one so I'll announce it here instead of at the board meeting um, but we did get that one also applied for Luzerne County ARPA funds yeah. and were denied how nobody was denied for ARPA yes, yes. 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 The schools every, were thrown every out every school was thrown out because of ESER I, I don't know what the justification if you went to those meetings that was a fun experience how they justified that but they took Hazleton and Crestwood's applications and dismissed them I actually looked into that, and I believe it's because um, you cannot match a federal grant with another federal grant. So I think they looked at ESER funding as um, your primary. But there were other there are other municipalities that, that had federal funding and entities. I, don't, I, I I'm sure they, they yeah. use whatever justification to exclude whoever or to put the 250k, 500k, one million on a on a list. Um, 
Crestwood was back on the list at one of the recent meetings, maybe in February was at the meeting, and then it just disappeared again. Uh, both Crestwood and Hazleton were taken off the list. So it was just, that was another opportunity would have been, well, we what we asked for. We threw everything on there right. as much as we could. What we asked safety. for, but we, even if they categorized us as a nonprofit or whatever, it would have been at least $500,000. Yeah, that's terrible. But, but let me throw something else out. So a lot of times uh, people say special education, it costs so much. Well, um, as a parent of two children in the special education program at, at Crestwood, um, you can't spend enough because you, special education in the spectrum is, is very wide. But there are federal grants for millions of dollars for which if you partner with a higher education institution, you can get the money to at least temporarily to give you some breathing room in your, your staff uh, salaries and benefits um, to, to fund special education staff to get training while they're in school, relieve some of that some of that part of your budget and push it into your salaries and benefits for your general education population. I mean, there are ways to do this. And, you know, this is, my frustration is that we have someone in place you know, working on this budget, and I don't see a lot of clarity around these types of financial issues that, that involve PDD directly, or with an understanding of how to make these, these changes so that we get out of the situation. I think it's very clear we, we know why we are where we are, and there are some very realistic ideas about how to get out from underneath this through grant funding, um, through it, you know, embracing Siemens differently and, and get grant funding. There are a lot of different ways to do this. And, and I just don't think these excuses are holding up anymore. And having a volunteer business manager or business consultant or whatever the heck is <coughs> under that, like, and, and, and saying that, you know, we're not sure that it's possible for a five-year plan. I don't believe it. I do this stuff every day. I make it work. So... And I'm one person, so you can't tell me that the nine of you up there can't find a real business manager who has qualifications working with PDE, who can do these kinds of transfers, who understands all of these things. You have parents. I was here. My son is graduating from this district in June. I was here when my son was in kindergarten because this district was going to get rid of full day kindergarten. I have been fighting this battle with other people all these years, and I'm still here. And he's 18, and I'm hearing, oh, well, we could try to do, we could try to do a five-year plan, or we could try to do this, and I'm not, it's not holding water for me anymore. I'm sorry. I appreciate that you're all doing volunteer public service work. I ran for the school board. I didn't get on there, but I still feel a duty to come here and hold you to the standards that you should be holding yourselves to. Like, we're all tired. We don't want to lose teachers. Why are we so focused on sports? She, her child brings her crayons home because she loves art, but we have the Taj Mahal of sports facilities and we can't pay teachers to teach art. We ought to be ashamed. I am ashamed and I'm not even on this board. And my son is graduating and you've got people coming up behind me begging for their kids to have art at school. It's just enough already. Appreciate the input, man. And we certainly are open to all ideas and suggestions. We certainly will take any assistance in grant writing. If you want to donate time and support grant writing ideas, you come across some, please share them. Mrs. Malanza will always be open Thank to those you. opportunities. And I, will. I will do that. Right. Please feel free. Grants are terrific, and it would yes. certainly help you moving forward, but your, your, your core issue is recurring expenses versus recurring revenue. I, I mean, a, a grant could help you for a year, two years, three years, maybe. But as long as long as expenses, recurring expenses, rise quicker than recurring revenue, you're going to be here every year. But you can buy yourself time and some breathing. Well, well that's called kicking the can down the road, which they've done for the last six or seven years. But not you, with you've, got fix, you've got to fix the right. problem. The problem is any, any expenses other expenses exceed revenue. Any other questions? Move to adjourn. Motion. Second. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned.
No, no. Community meeting. Okay. Community okay. meeting. <laughs> Not yet, Mark. Okay, okay. okay. Human resources. I'll be making a motion to approve the minutes of the March 9th, 2023 Human Resources Committee meeting. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Mm -hmm. I will be looking for a motion to move forward item one through eight on the Human Resources Committee. Motion. Any any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Motion. Seeing none, make a motion for. Uh, <laughs> a motion to move items one through eight to the board agenda for next week. Can I get a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any open discussion items for HR? From the board or from the public? Seeing none, I move to adjourn human resources. Policy Committee, Mrs. Campbell. Uh, thank you. Uh, myself, uh, Ms. McCurdy, and Mr. Boone are all present. Um, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the March 9th uh, policy meeting. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm going to be looking to move the following policies um, to the meeting next week. Uh, under number one, um, two of them under first reading and adopt. And and then five under second reading and adopt. Um, are there any questions from, from the board? Yes, sir. Uh, I believe uh, 321 oh, was okay. passed in February oh, under second okay. reading and adopt. That one has already been uh, okay. taken care of, so we actually have four under second reading and adopt. It was passed in February. February. Do you have any updates on any of these for what you're changing if this is just Sure. Um, extracurricular, we're more, Jack and I reviewed it, and we're more just trying to make it more specific, more clear. Um, Trauma-informed approach, um, I know, was reviewed by the principals and has more to do with training of the teachers and students. Um, the second reading down here, I know we reviewed, I don't know if anyone, um, hazing, bullying now is going into cyberbullying, other than just in the school. Physical examination has more to do with um, new employees have to get a physical examination. It has more to do with definitions. Um, and then the sponsorship agreements is, are what we talked about. Yeah, and really in the previous meetings. Okay. Um, any questions from the public on the policies? I would like to um, yeah. just ask about the sponsorship agreements. Mm -hmm. um, there was mention in that policy about naming rights to the the old house, for example, or any anything else, um, and I think it mentioned that someone could pay a certain amount of money and maybe have those rights, in, you know, into infinity, right? As long as that building exists, I'm wondering um, why we wouldn't consider doing something on maybe an annual basis. I mean, I, I understand that maybe to some that might seem disruptive, but I'm just wondering if having that as an opportunity to raise revenue, significantly raise revenue, and have it become something where different organizations in the community will be putting more and more money, sort of an auction or something like to that effect? Just yeah, no, I mean, I think that's another valid point. I mean, nothing set up that up a naming right is forever. Like, it, any naming right we set up, we would set yearly a set, con a a set yearly contract, contract for. You know what I mean? Kind of like with the I sign of the front. language. Maybe I misread Kind of like the sign up front we set, um, is it by month or? By month. But per, per month we per month. correct? Per, per month. month. Right, so we set up a, a timeline on that, like per month. So if someone came and said, hey, I want to name the field house, sorry, um, we would set up, what what does that mean? You right, know? Depends, so, what they are, right. depends on what they offer. The difference is, is the sign out front, like FNCB donated the money for that, and it cost the district nothing, and they got permanent naming right. rights. If you put a name on a building, and I'm just speculating here, it should only be for a short term, right. not infinity, but it has to be a term because you can't turn that right. around every year either. Right. There's got to be some something more structurally and, and with an identity and a certain dollar amount. Um, it wouldn't be that. I wouldn't suggest year to year, but advertising on the, the, the billboard and stuff like that, I think 
those can just be ongoing. And I have the policy here in front of me, and uh, one of the items states that generally a sponsorship agreement shall not have a term greater than 10 years or provide for automatic renewals or extensions, nor shall it allow for payments to the district during periods beyond the term of the contract or in excess of the prorated benefit and so on. So there is uh, a, a general guideline to for us to stay within the 10 years on, on something that large. But we would, I mean, anybody could consider something shorter term and potentially yeah. with oh, the revenue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we could write it up. Yeah, the thing is you are, as we talked before though, it would be for the board, you know, I mean. And sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ms. Otero, did you email those to the board? Yes, I did. Today? Yeah, everybody got a copy <coughs> today and they'll be on after this meeting today. They'll be on the website. Thank you. Um, so any questions from the public on these policies? I, oh. I have a really quick question about um, the trauma-informed mm -hmm. approach policy. It, it may be dumb, but where did that policy originate from? Like, where is that? Is that from the PSBA. PSBA. But I'm under the understanding that it's not for training for teachers. Right. That we are, we are, we are developing curriculum and we are actually going to have to teach something additional. Uh, like the way that, that correct? The, the way that I read it is, you know, like I teach math in the district and the way that I, when I was reading that policy, uh, it, I think I'm going to have to embed it like this trauma approach somehow in my math curriculum. So I'm wondering how I'm going to do that. It's math. Kind of like no drama, you know? <laughs> but it, it states that the teachers will, will be developing curriculum. It's, it's, and then we said it was for our training, but that's, well, that's, I mean, that's how I read it. I mean, you guys obviously read it through it through a teacher, you know, and I read it, but, and how we, you know, and I read the parts of how you, you each student was going to be treated on a case-by-case case basis. Stuff like that, when we had uh, rhythm, or when the kids were going on, like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the direction here. of this policy. I really am. Um, because I feel like it dictates our curriculum. Well, yeah, and I don't think that's, and I'll, I'm glad you brought it up, because I can't say that's how I read it, but that's no. definitely something I think we're gonna have to go back with the principals then and discuss because yeah. that wasn't the intent that I was kind of explained and what I was under. But yeah, if there's some words we have to take out, yeah, you can't, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be teaching trauma approach as a math. Right, yeah, I don't Right, no, I mean, that's, that's. It's kind of sometimes you know? Right, it's a policy we have to, it's a policy we're being told we have to have, but we can definitely change it to make sure it's really meant well, for what it's meant. Well, <laughs> Yeah. I would just like make a suggestion so we can get to the bottom of it. Why don't you just make uh, it first reading, and that way you could have a month to address the concerns instead of the first reading and adopt that you could amend that motion for, for the board meeting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just appreciate a, that. We, I think uh, we need some more thought okay. going to go into that policy. But just a quick note on trauma informed. I'm, I'm not sure everything that it, it said in that curriculum or what they are asking you to do through those words exactly, but just going through trauma training, it's looking at each student through that lens. It, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys understand that. That's, and maybe that's what PSEA is trying to get across, that we have to understand what these kids are going through, that's and that good. you're not to teach that. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's probably more on that. Yeah. Um, Ms. Foster said that on more I think it's now it's it's it'll be a yearly. But okay. but why don't we do that? Why don't we put it to just first reading, Thank not you. adopt, and then we could it maybe you guys can either to the principals or, or to us just let us know what words kind of triggered you guys. You know okay. what I mean? What words kind of and we we could look at it that way. Thank you so much. So can we just say that? Yeah, so we could just do that. We're gonna, I'll change it. It's okay. going to be yeah. fixed okay. on the agenda next right. week. Okay. Now, the okay. other one's still first reading and adopt. Right. Right. Okay. So you need a motion. <coughs> do we do that? I'll make a motion to uh, have first reading only on policy 146.1. Okay, second. And the rest is the same. Just do the those. The remainder are the same. Okay. Second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Stephanie with 321 off. With 321 on.
Right. Yeah. Right. Um, any other discussions on policy and the border community? No? Okay. Then I adjourn the committee. Thank you. Academics, <laughs> Mr. Boone. <laughs> Uh, seeking a motion to approve the minutes of March 9, 2023 Academic Programs Committee meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, we have uh, three items to be moved to next week's agenda. Any questions, comments, or input from the board? Uh, number three, is that our pre-K counts? Yes. Okay. Public? Uh, therefore, I make a motion to uh, move items one, two, and three under part four to next year or next year's next week's uh, board meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. <clears throat> Open discussion. Um, Ms. Malazzo. Uh, so we just added the PSSA schedule. We've been discussing that over the last couple uh, work sessions. So we just have those dates there, just letting everyone know that the PSSAs and keystones are coming up. Um, and uh, just another discussion that goes along with PSSA Commerce Let's Soar initiative um, will be starting next week. So you're gonna, if you stop by the schools, um, you're going to see decorations. You're just going to see a lot of Comet pride within the schools. We invited the media to come. So it's our first annual Comets Let's Soar day. So I want to thank the volunteers, the PTA volunteers, our administration, um, our vendors. Um, with their participation to allow us to give the students a silicon good luck bracelet, a magical pencil before their test, and the staff were, um, whoever wanted to, they, they got a t-shirt that says Comets Let's Soar, and that was fully funded by uh, sponsorships through uh, the community, so I want to thank them again, um, and that's just very exciting. And then also, um, Probably tomorrow afternoon, because I'm not sure what time we're going to get out here, and I don't like to send Blackboard messages out too late to the families, um, but there will be a message that will be going out to families tomorrow afternoon, um, just reminding everyone that the 23-24 school calendar was approved last month. Um, we are starting a little bit early, but for um, grades 1st through 12th, the first start of day of school is <coughs> August 24th. First day of kindergarten is August 28th. Again, this will be all in the letter that goes out to the families. Um, and then also to focus on our core curriculum, uh, increase our STEM activities, and also provide efficiency through transportation for our families um, and the district here. The start time for Rice and Fairview will be at 9.05. So, we just want to get that communication out. The uh, dismissals time does stay the same at 335. So the student day is 905 to 335. And we're just trying to be transparent for planning purposes to just know that your bus time schedule is just like it's always communicated in the summer. Um, just for planning purposes, if you're thinking about it now, it potentially could be anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes later. So I just want to get that information out to you. Um, but we, we are making that change. If you have a secondary campus student from 7th through 12th grade, there are no changes. So it's just the elementary changes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, just stepping back to the PSSAs and the, the test, when are the scores coming out for all of those? There's a window, mm -hmm. is it June? There's a window where we'll be able to see. Early results come the end of June, beginning of July. Parent reports don't typically are not typically populated until September. Right, but we'll have it like for administration. But we can can we share that with the public or no? No, that's, that's just for us. And this year it was really late too. So um, they said possibly because of the governor change that there was some politics. I think they said so. There was a delay this year. It came out a little bit later, but um, where are they? Because the, the so for instance the PSSA schools. I have a ninth grader who's finishing um, ninth grade who took PSSA. PSSA is in the eighth grade, and we haven't received those scores. The individual, like the individual, mailed to your house or anything like that. You haven't had that. No, uh, did everyone else? No. No, I'm just asking. Oh. So okay, so okay. Um, we can get that information for you if you want oh, to know so the score. Oh, have to ask for their scores. Uh, well, I can tell you that I did not send anything out through Blackboard message. No. Okay, I'm just wondering what because in the past, like we would get an envelope. Mm -hmm. The kids would get, have enough, which 
I would prefer if that was sent home directly to the parent. Instead of through, right, instead, yeah. But they're just, so the scores from, from academic year 2022 are in hand. They just need to be distributed, or we need to request them. We, we did not distribute them. And is it by request? Do you want to answer that, Mr. Sayer, for your building? I can speak to Fairview. Right. Received the box of parent reports and the parent reports were sent home. Did Bryce get theirs? Yes, ma'am. They were I, distributed I to my family. Secondary? They, they were not sent out. No. So what, did we get them, or do we have to send them out? They should have. They were delivered to the school. So, so we will look into board, that. To yes. Sent out to everyone. So we'll look into the secondary campus. Obviously, there's something there that we need to look into. But in the meantime, if you want the score, reach out to me and we'll get your individual score. Um, if you're looking for the overall data of the how the district did, I can give you a link to that too. That's a good okay. Thank you for bringing that up because I, I would not have known the secondary campus thing. Yes. I don't know, did anybody else in the public have any questions about that? I was just asking about the change in the elementary day. Sure. That 905 start, it's, what is it, 15 minutes later? I, I can't remember what yes. the, the start time is now. How does that change the curriculum during the day? Do we have a plan for that for the kids, or is it just a, a, a pre-announcement for the start time and end time for next year? So the announcement that the information that's going out tomorrow is just a quick burst of information right. for families for planning. Right. Um, in the future, we've worked with administration. We, we have a schedule in place. Uh, in place where we have some ideas that we'd like to do with that time. So we're going to continue to strategize, okay. make the best of those times, and then the future announcement will go out with what this bell schedule looks like or what the classroom looks like. Um, but briefly, I can say that the library, you know, that big space there will continue to be a library. I know that was a concern of some that, you know, we were going to get rid of the library space. Um, we have an idea for STEM, partial STEM, and partial library. So, again, more communication um, as soon as it's ready to go out to the families. Um, we want to discuss it with the teachers, too. We, we want to get their feedback to create that space and that time. Um, but we're still going to have co-math time. We're still going to have comment time. Um, but it's really a dedicated fo focus if they're not in uh, gym or if they're not in music. They're going to be focusing on core curriculum with their teachers. Um, more time for intervention, more time for learning support, more time for exact pathway, um, challenging pieces. So all of that communication will be coming out shortly. Is it the, I, I, I was writing something down. That's the okay. library situation you were saying is that that's, you're talking about the what's space. sort of being shifted in the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. There's going to be, the, the space will remain the same and still um, the facilities will be the same, the books, everything else, but, but modified to balance STEM and library? Yeah, so if you could take a, if you visualize like what it looks like now, just cut it in half, we'll say. Half of it will be intact as the library space, so all the mm -hmm. books will stay there. It'll be like a sign-out sheet, so if the teacher wants to take them down to the library and, and dedicate that 45 minutes that they're not in a special and they want to go to the library to continue to read, hands-on with a book, they'll be able to do that. Um, and then the teacher can be able to sign them out into the STEM area, which is going to be uh, an area of, you know, Legos, uh, age-appropriate material. I'm looking at microscopes. I2M, part of our initiative of growing STEM into our early ages, is going to be uh, as funding that piece of that. I think that's great, and I, I don't know that, that people are really aware of that just yet, so if that could be communicated more widely, and if that could be, instead of just bifurcated, I guess trifurcated, to include um, an art section, um, I, I realize it's probably a lot to ask of teachers to even oversee that, but something even at the basic level would probably be appreciated, and I'm quite sure, again, your plans to fund something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Where are we going to get the funding for the Legos and the I just mentioned that I I2M, I, I just mentioned to you, to everyone, I2M has dedicated funds to help with creation of this STEM. Is it going to be this rock star STEM the first year? Absolutely not. But if, as grants come in, as things are coming in, we will then create that space. So, um, but there, I appreciate that because you're right. I need to get that out there more. There's a lot of people that are asking questions 
Um, I, I wanted to start with the time change first. Um, you know, I, I'm meeting with some of the board members tomorrow to show them exactly the spaces, but I can't start that project until school lets out. Um, so it, once school lets out, we're going to be talking about all this too. Um, it, the positive of it, right, of yeah. increasing this space into a library and a STEM piece. I just, because I think people see it as being cut off and, and, and not available at all. And yeah. what you're describing is much more. I only have a concern, that's why I asked about the schedule, is what's the schedule look like with less teachers and more opportunities for STEM in those elementary schools? And I realize that has to be taken into consideration with the furloughs. Yeah. So I don't know how you do more of that, as important as it is, losing art and library and losing those faculty, but also adding more curriculum-based ideas and initiatives. I'm really eager to see that schedule. And if I may, those library kits already existed in the library. They are being used as librarians for, for STEM related projects. I know in our, in our first grade classes, we go, we buy these magnet builders. We do a STEM program at the end of the day and that's STEM for first grade. And as a point of reference on the earlier topic that was debated about capital money, Siemens was going to transform our STEM program. I don't know where any of that stuff is or where the long-term plan is with that, but we've had, other than a couple kids that they sent over to the middle school, I haven't seen anything. Right. And the numbers bear that out. That's all I have. Thank you. I, I have one thing academic related. And this isn't me speaking as a budget guy, just as an alum and a support of the district. Every month in the superintendent's report, Natasha highlights student achievement, whether it be academic, athletic, urban activities. Every once in a while, there's one that really stands out. And last month was one of those cases, and I wanted to congratulate some people. And in particular, it was the, our math students' performance in the Luzerne County Math Contest. I see Lorley in the back, but I know he's the advisor for it. Um, a, a 11th grader named Saif R R Raymond, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, Scott Lenio, uh, third place as a senior. We had several others in the top 10 or top 12, and that is an extremely challenging test. I, I took it many decades ago, and if you get 40%, um, 50% on it, which is a clear F, you're going to finish pretty high in that, score, in, in that contest. If you could get it to 60, you might win it, and that would be an F in, in a class. So we, I, I saw the picture of how many kids sat for it. I was blown away by that, and and the, the performance was, it was incredible. Wilkes gives a full scholarship to the winners or whoever finishes the highest who wants to accept one. And it, I, I could assure you that these kids didn't do that well just from regular classroom work. Someone pushed them early, their parents themselves, their, their, the students, they, because it's the type of problems you have to almost treat like art. You gotta be really creative in how to approach it. And so, you know, Great job, Lorley, and, and everyone in the department. Pardon? We can at least have 10 juniors and 14 and 10 seniors. Okay. It was fun. It was so exciting. And while we're on that topic as well, the Crestwood Education Foundation, which Amanda pointed out that she founded and co founded with Barry Boone, mm -hmm. we're raising money. As much as possible, I see Bob Derwin in the crowd. I'm probably going to miss other people. There's several on the board that are also part of that foundation as volunteers raising money to try to offset the cost that the school can't cover. They're, they're venture grants. They're really important initiatives that was never capitalized in this district history. So they could be, where are our venture grants? How much are they? Are they capped at? No, I think 15, oh, 1500. Yeah. $1,500 grants, money that's raised from this community by businesses like I2M and individuals. We have a social coming up on May 6th. We need all the support that we could get because if the Education Foundation doesn't have money to support these things and the district doesn't have money, then these kids aren't going to have the opportunities that we keep talking about or the extra support. We funded the Odyssey of the Mind team last year at One Worlds. The district never paid any money for that team. And I'm excited to say that Ed Griffiths, who was volunteer leader, he's now on the Education Foundation Board. So we need that synergy from all the people that are asking questions and offering ideas and wanting to help to make a difference. Um, to be fair, we helped fund that, but the whole community well, rallied for that one. Right. That was a huge deal. And it was, it was a large amount from the Education yeah, Foundation. A, yes. Thank you. Any other discussion on academic programs? If not, we'll adjourn that one. And move to technology, Mrs. McCurdy. Uh, 
um, Mr. Nardone and Ms. Campbell are present. Um, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the March 9th, 2023 Technology Committee meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Uh, oh, so, uh, make a motion to approve the minute. Oh, sorry. Okay. Never mind that number four then. Um, we don't have any items for to move to the agenda for next month. Um, are there any questions or any updates? I, I do have one additional question. If they, if these furloughs have to happen, <coughs> um, I know that you know coaches and other things. There's um, you can get clearances to have volunteers. Can they work during the school day within the school? I'm sorry. Explain the question for a minute. So, um, I know with after school programming, if, say, retired teachers, um, they can re up their credentials and clearances to volunteer for the program. We have paid teachers, but then we also have volunteers. But in the K through 12 under PDE rules, can you have public volunteers with their clearances working within the school? So, for instance, you have. Well, I, I, I just. Yep. There's all. The answer, the, the broad answer. I'm not talking about business management. No, I'm talking, talking about business. the broad answer. Oh, talking about a teacher? Yeah, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a teacher. That, that's going to lead to contractual problems with the union. If the union would have to sign off that we're using a volunteer teacher. Okay. So, for the room that you were talking about, if you had it set up for art, library, and STEM, you couldn't have. A volunteer retired teacher who had clearances not because, not, because you fur furloughed a teacher. No, not without. We'd have to have the union sign what's called an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, yep. saying it's no different than if we wanted to give you as a teacher, yep. you did a great job, here's $5,000. We would be in violation of the contract if we did that. We'd been grieved on that. Yep. Uh, not necessarily with this union, but with other unions. Okay. So uh, if the union signed off, we could have volunteer. So you must work with, with the, the staff, the union staff that you have for instruction. Correct. You can't have volunteers. Okay, thank you. And we can't cross either. So like a, yep. a support staff can't cross to. And, and so in. essentially you can only, once the furloughs happen, you can only check the board. Well, actually you check the board, then you furlough. Correct. Make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Behavioral Intervention, Health and Safety Committee, Mr. Program. Uh, I'll be seeking approval of the minutes from the March, 8, uh, March 9th uh, meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we have no items to move forward for voting next week. Um, on open discussions, we have nothing specific under here. Um, I, just a quick uh, feedback from from either Ms. Malazzo or the principals about the Avidum Club and also the unified track and field teams and what, what progress that we've made there. Um, so I can, I'll start and then if you want to add principals. So uh, Unified just had their first meet here. Um, I believe it was April 3rd, don't quote me the date, um, but they, they started their season for Unified Track. Um, currently, right now, in the secondary campus, right outside the office there, there's fundraising. Um, all the funds go to the Special Olympics. It's called the Polar Pop. It's also a part of our Common Flip Soar Day on Friday the 21st, so we wanted to include both of those pieces together. Um, so thank you already for those. You should see the students. I think I heard the other day that someone brought $50 in pennies and quarters just to uh, pop over Mr. Parentoni's head. So it, <laughs> the, the students are having a really great time with that. Um, and the Vietnam Club actually just told me yesterday, part of Comets Let's Soar, they are going to be um, chalking out front here and drawing designs and wishing everyone good luck. So um, they are definitely, and that's through the leadership of our administration team, making sure that they're all involved. And um, so, yes, they're, they're heavily involved in the district. Uh, who's the leader on the Vietnam Club or so, the administration? Uh, so. Comments Let's Soar is Mr. Archangeli, but um, I know Jeff Parent Mr. Parentoni, Mr. Gorm have okay. all been a part of that, but Mrs. Savaki is the lead of that. She's the, so she's right. the lead, lead, but as far as... Okay. Working more closely with Mr. Yeah, we had a grant approved at the Education Foundation, and we noticed it was unspent in the club, and I don't know if it was something that they had planned, um, or... 
I mean, I, anything we could do to support the club because it's one of the key initiatives on positive behavior. I just was curious to see if you, if anybody knew about that. Um, I, I know specifically Mr. Broken, but I can certainly talk to Mrs. Beck tomorrow and any, you know, money that is available for, for them. Right. We able to use that. Sure yeah, no, I mean, I think it was $800. They, 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 they were, um, if I recall that, there was multiple years on that. They did get money in one year, and then the second year, nothing yet. We had, you met on our budget report yesterday, we had an unspent money. That was for, for the latest grant. Oh, okay. All right. But I just like to hear their updates. Yeah, okay. no, they're doing a great job. Yeah. I have Thanks. a question um, for the principals. Just what programming do we have coming up for the students? Yeah, so one of the things, um, you know, that kind of grabbed our attention recently is um, we had a couple incidents um, on the secondary camp campus of violations of policy 227, which for everybody who doesn't know what that is, that would be a, a student um, that is under the influence or in possession of um, alcohol or drugs on school property. So we had some minor incidents uh, recently, which is not an uncommon occurrence in a public school setting, but to us it was something that we felt we needed to address very quickly and uh, make sure that we, you know, we, we looked into that real quick. So. Uh, Mr. Parentoni, uh, myself, Mr. Arcangeli, we are, um, you know, we've been in touch with the Wright Township Police Department. They are going to assist us in bringing back the D.A.R.E. program, as well as uh, moving forward, we're going to provide some additional education pieces to our um, middle school level, especially, and target those grade levels to give them some education on uh, drugs and alcohol. So that's one thing that we felt needed to be addressed immediately. Um, one of the big things that's kind of hot off the press is um, in our elementary buildings we have what we call the school-based behavioral health teams that assist students in those buildings with behavioral issues. Um, myself and Mr. Arcangeli um, at our annual meeting with the team and all the different agencies, um, I brought up the potential to bring that onto the secondary campus um, and we felt that we had a need. Um, being in other districts, it's not something that happens um, very easily because they need to show that there's a need among your population. We received notification that we were approved um, at no cost to the district. It's fully funded by outside sources for a master's level therapist and two behavior techs on the secondary campus. So we are very excited about that. that is that is that those, those, those so we're going to, we, we will have a, a fully functioning uh, behavioral support team, school-based behavioral support team on the secondary campus, focusing our efforts on seventh and eighth grade, where we feel if we curb those behaviors, that we're curbing them for the future. Um, you know, and we do see that they dwindle off as students mature. Um, so that was uh, huge news that we really just received um, and kind of put the pieces together. Um, you know, just to go back on that uh, that one thing I said about policy 227 violations, and I, I don't want to forget to mention this, that, and it kind of goes with, and I don't want to get back on that topic, but the trauma-informed um, information and teachers um, being aware of these type of things, that is a, tra a trauma situation where that those children have gone through something in their life causing them to make those decisions, and I want to give credit to, in, in these instant instances, where the teachers were the first line of defense and they have had brought those things to our attention immediately which was you know something that we can't really put into words how well they do in those situations and you know make us aware that those things are going on and, and very quickly so i just wanted to thank them for that um so along with those positives and continued needs uh trying to develop and are going to develop a health and wellness fair for our middle school students um, we're trying to identify a date that's going to work with all the testing that will get a little crazy here in a little over a week, especially with our middle school, middle school students. So sometime the end of May or early June, um, that's through the Leadership Northeast Impact Program. Currently, Ms. Chase, Mr. Lawson, Ms. Zan and Ms. Zanicki are our uh, three-member team from our secondary campus that's going down to that leadership. 
uh, presentation. Uh, they've been going uh, you know, once per month for the entire year, and they are speaking glowingly about it. Uh, one of the students that runs it, actually the former student at Crestwood, um, and, and, and works really closely with Mr. Lawson, and they can't say enough about it. So part of what our team needs to do is bring back something from that leadership, uh, from that program, and what they think that our school needs the most. And after coming in and talking with uh, Mr. Moore and myself, Mr. Parentoni, felt that the health and wellness fair, along with the DARE program we wanted to do here, right at the end of the school year, uh, you know, before we head into summer, summer with a lot of changing going on from seventh to eighth, eighth to ninth, uh, would be a good final message. Uh, so we have a lot of things planned, you know, behaviorally, you know, between now and the end of the school year that continue to put us in a positive light. Hopefully, you know, it, it hits home and it works. That's this program certainly designed for. So uh, it'll be the first time we held a, had a, held a health awareness and a wellness fair like this to bring the vendors in. We're excited for the planning. I know those three teachers are really excited about it. And, uh, you know, they know that they have our full support. Next week during Comments Let's Soar, we're going to introduce a, a support service Canine, correct? This is Malaza. I may know a little bit more about this than I do. Yep. So uh, we have two Shelties and a Great yep. Dane coming to the secondary campus, therapeutic dogs. Um, we're going to introduce that, and um, we're very excited about that. And then that will be kind of pioneered into the elementaries for next year, as far as the library goes, um, where at-risk students will be able to read to the dog in a safe space. <coughs> of course, there's a lot of paperwork and policies and things like that we're going to go through in board action. Um, but that is another positive behavior piece that we're going to start introducing. But we're going to start on comments that soar at the secondary campus. Correct. I mean, in the, the celebratory breakfast we'll have next week, not that it's so much behavioral, <clears throat> but when we're talking about positive behavior intervention, celebratory breakfast, you know, celebrating all the hard work that's got into motivating our students from PSSA scores, things like that. But it's things like that that, you know, they're, it's a culmination of, again, positive and paying it forward. And here's how we're going to finish the year extremely strong. So we have those going as well uh, for our middle school and then Sorty here at the secondary campus. Uh, will be a full day. Uh, and it's, again, looking forward to that. So we have a lot of different things going. I apologize. I could speak a little bit uh, more directly with uh, Invitam, uh, Mr. Brogna, uh, Mr. Paratoni's absence here, but uh, we will get you more information on that. Great. Uh, being able to, again, to appropriate those funds correctly. Uh, but you know, again, we're excited about some of the programs we have coming up here in May and early June. We have nothing on the on the agenda. We have a lot of great things going on. <laughs> well, and I'll add one more. So, uh, Mr. Worm that contacted today. So, um, we are going to have. Actually, I should start by saying a member of the community reached out to me. Um, he works at New York Life, and he messaged me and said, I have a grant opportunity for you. Are you interested? So we had a conversation yesterday. Um, there will be five uh, members from the secondary campus, five members from the Rice campus. We will be sitting on uh, just staff only, no students, about bereavement with students and family and just giving us the tools on how to handle that situation and best support them by us having the conversation with them less than an hour we're gonna receive $500 grants for both of the schools. So $1,000 grants, again, all that stuff adds up and it's just part of the positive behavior and just giving the tools for our administration um, and our guidance counselors in those circumstances. So yep. so that's that's brand new too. That's great. Our committee is awesome. <laughs> uh, it's you're the chair. That's cool. Yeah, no, I just one more question because I don't know if it was if I missed it. Did, did you mention the, the settlement with Jewel already or was that? I did not, no. You want me to, I well, I think it's important because if sure. we ever needed any funds for any of these positive behaviors, that right. would be the money to use. Right. We, uh, if you recall, uh, Mr. Broder, just as a recap, and I briefed the board on this last, I believe it was last October, uh, we joined a class action lawsuit pending in the Northern District of California with various school districts throughout the United States uh, in an action against Juul tobacco or Juul vaping products. Uh, you may have saw it, the announcement of the settlement it was on the news last night. Uh, we knew about it last week. Uh, we signed the release. Uh, based upon that settlement, uh, our prorated share, and I checked to make sure it was accurate because to make sure other districts weren't getting, we were getting short change. We're going to get about $27,000. 
if you recall, when we went into this, we thought we were going to get about five. But we, they sent information to us uh, along with the superintendent. We provided a detailed demographic information to the people in California, which increased our proportional share to 27,000, which we should receive in the next fiscal year, earmarked to educate on yeah. vaping issues. If we have drug and, and uh, alcohol awareness programs that cost anything, that's where that money should come from to prevent and, and reduce the, the use and abuse. Um, but again, it was a surprise that a dollar amount, and I'm sure there's other funding for activities and stuff. And so many of our law enforcement who are overwhelmed as well are trying to do their best. So they may not be able to handle the programs, but I, from a positive behavior standpoint, I think that's one of the most significant things we can do is STEM at a young age. And the health, and, and I have to add the health and wellness, um, because Mr. Lawson and Mrs. Zavak, we participated in the, I think you mentioned that as part of it, the leadership, well, Wilkes-Barre Leadership yeah. Northeast. Yes. This is a program that our teachers a few years ago didn't join in. And the last couple of years, um, it, you know, you're, you're allowing a teacher to be out of, out of class. But what they're doing is, is meeting with other teachers across the districts and, and they're planning, each of them are planning something to bring back and implement in their district. And I, you know, again, where the cost is, is small, the return is huge, a health and wellness fair, uh, and something that we really could use. So I'm I'm really enthusiastic about our participation yeah, I, I, in that I, and what we're able to bring back. I can't say enough how enthusiastic yeah, I those, can't. Those, those folks are when they go and they come back. Yeah. And I spoke to other people that are, that are at that, that, you know, that, that leadership as well from other school districts. He said the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and even if you have a teacher that, you know, maybe middle of the road or 20 years or whatever, you need an extra boost or, a, you know, a new focus, send them down to this. If that's how great it is. So, I'm just grateful uh, that our, our district our, supported our that again this year. Fantastic. And we, I think we were the only school that was allowed to have three. Yes. Typically. Who did I miss? Um, Mrs. Zavacki, Mr. Lawson. And, and uh, Mrs. Chase. Andy, Mrs. Yeah. Andy, Mr. Lawson, and Mrs. Uh, Shelby Chase. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So okay. we were, and they were ecstatic that we had that much interest. So I'm hoping next year when we come to the faculty, we have that interest again, that they're willing to, to be a part of that. Very good, thank you. Uh, official plan committee, Mr. Berman. Uh, I'll be seeking a, a motion and approval of the minutes of the March 9th meeting. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, we have no items to move forward to the board meeting next week. However, I guess the ongoing question and the open discussions, are we okay? Are we moving in the right direction with the sewer? And well, I guess uh, it's back to me. <laughs> um, but I do have an update. I just got an update for those of you who are concerned about the fire up on the mountain. Uh, the fire is not, as we sit here, under control. It's now burning towards oh, God. Penn Lake. Uh, that came right from the fire company. Uh, but anyway, uh, so those of you in Penn Lake, uh, if there's anyone here, which is in our district, you may smell some smoke, and I hope that's all that happens. Uh, as far as the sewer system, uh, last night we received a proposal from Benish Engineering uh, regarding bypassing the bad broken pipe. Uh, we are, uh, it's a very reasonable estimate about eight thousand dollars which just that is for the design and construction management of it we anticipate putting that out to bid for summer work uh, <coughs> as part of our cost saving measures uh, I spoke with Benish today we were going to purchase the grinder pump through CoStars and not put it as part of the bid package that way <coughs> there will be no markup on it so we'll get it at cost and the, the, the contract was all running electrical line from the auditorium to the grinder pump, a distance about 55 feet. I have an idea of what that is going to cost, but I don't want to announce it in public because it's going to be out for bid, so I don't want any potential bidders knowing what it's going to cost, but uh, it will be put out for bid hopefully in the next month or so. Uh, so that's all good news. I'm also looking at an alternative, and I have a call into somebody on line, what's called line bursting, if we elect to try i don't think we can but i want to make sure that that is foreclosed forever of bursting the line under the middle school so we don't have to do a grinder pump i don't think we can do that but i would like 
somebody who's still a professional look at it. So I have a call in on that. So that's all good. Yesterday, as far as mechanical work, along with NRG controls, uh, we toured the secondary campus in Fairview Elementary uh, to try to analyze and address the heating issues and cooling issues we've had in both places. Uh, NRG, who has a local service technician available, lives in Laurel Run, uh, is very happy to try and service our needs. They had some ideas. Uh, as uh, Janice knows, when I was over there, uh, one of the first areas we have to address are the baseboards to make sure they're properly controlled. Uh, so we're on top of that, but that's as of yesterday. So that, that was good news. Uh, we're going to get a proposal from NRG for them to be our service technician to replace Siemens. And as you know from a memo I sent around yesterday, there's some issues I want to deal with on Siemens that I don't think are appropriate for public comment. Thank you. Can I ask a couple questions about that? Sure. On the sewer situation, um, were cameras dropped into yes. every single pipe? Yes. So in, in, the, in the entirety of um, the linear footage, Multiple. Multiple. Okay, so everything was clear with the exception of that one response. I'll give you the specifics. Outside of between second and third hall, there's a courtyard. Mm -hmm. We dropped camera from from that clean out, which goes under the art room, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Am I right, Damien? It goes under the art room. So it goes through the courtyard under the art room, a distance about 200 feet. That pipe is not broken. That pipe is terracotta. And it is, I don't want to say fractured, but it, it is, does have some uh, terracotta hanging down, which causes solids to back up at times. So we flush that daily, and we have not had a problem since we start flushing it daily. Where it comes out from the, under the art room in the courtyard, is that right here? Uh, wherever the art room is. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, it's okay. right here. All right. <laughs> There's a clean out that then runs under the middle school, under the old middle school library, runs to underground terracotta. We camera this whole thing. It runs to a, a manhole, which is under Mrs. Cloaker's room, five feet down. And that's where the bumps go. So that's the, the breakage is between yeah. the art room clean out and Mrs. Cloaker's room. We cameraed it. It's broken in two spots. It also sags. So that's why I don't think we could pipe burst it, but I need that confirmation. Uh, we then, to the left of the clean out at the art room, there's a new clean out which only services Mrs. The, Mrs. Is it Mrs. Zavaki? <coughs> Mrs. Zavaki's room? Is that right? Do I have that right, Damien? Where was this at? What's it, room? It's, it's in the home ec room. The home ec room. Right. It services yes. the home ec room. In the home no, 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 no. no. We're not. We're gonna. We're gonna abandon that one. We're gonna hook up the. the yes, from okay. the art room outlet to the line forty feet away, which is good, which services Mrs. Zavaki's home ec. And we're gonna grinder pump. We have to grinder pump because the one is like is lower than the other. One's six feet deep. One's four feet deep. So we grinder pump it up. We service two bathrooms and and uh, a sink with that. So the four inch line is satisfactory. And then that's going to flow down to a different manhole. So that should solve our problem. Eventually, though, we are going to have to replace the terracotta line in the, in the uh, no, the terracotta line in the courtyard between second and third hall. We're eventually going to have to do that. That's not critical priority as we sit here. It's going to have to be done. It's on our agenda. Okay, so, so that's an example of an item, you know, the integrity of your sewer system sounds like there's some issues overall, and that's something that gets built into something like a five-year plan. You, you address the emergency now, but to be honest, a grinder pump or bursting a pipe sounds a little band-aid-ish to me. But what no, actually, a grinder pump is a permanent solution. Well, the grinder pump, you, you, yes, you're right. And but bursting a pipe, when you say bursting a pipe, that's a misnomer. We're not bursting the pipe apart. It's actually going to be a brand new pipe, essentially. Put in. in order to do the redirect? No, no, that's no. an option. We, Okay. That's so. It, that, those are not band-aids. Those are permanent solutions. Okay. Either way. And, and then, what you're saying is that the rest of it is all terracotta, and the long-term integrity might be. No, the, the the rest of it is not terracotta. It's terracotta from second and third hall courtyard to the art room. Okay. 
Is there still a tree growing out of one of the toilets in the bathroom? There never, there has not been a tree growing out of the toilets in three or four years. In fact, we got, we heard that rumor, and okay. Mrs. McCurdy and I did an inspection. <laughs> what? If, okay. There is no. That's not. That's a false rumor. Actually, a root, a root, not a tree. It's part of the root, and I believe that that tree was taken down at that time. Years ago. Yeah. Okay. After that extent. Because I, I understand. So that's the type. That's the type of anecdotal rumors that need to be just ignored. Because right, but but on the other hand, when you have kids that want to use bathrooms and they're closed, I, I hear two rumors. One is that that because of all the vaping going on, they want kids. Um, sequestered to certain bathrooms, which I sort of understand, but then when you're closing bathrooms simply because you have a tree root growing out of it. No, that, was, that, that did not happen. Okay. Not this year. That was in the and student We, we questioned that in the beginning of the year at one of the committee meetings, and that was still we, that's we the don't close, We don't yeah, close no. bathrooms for vaping. Yeah. That's, right. So that's just a rumor going around with the kids. That's a false yeah. statement. Because right. right. we did question that at the beginning of the year, because a bunch of us were hearing that rumor. And I have a, brought it up. if you're interested in looking at the line, I have it on flash drive. That's okay. But the, but is there a problem with kids dropping the vapes into when we, the toilets and then causing some of these problems? Uh, when we went open the manholes on the far side mm -hmm. of the school, there's two manholes, one outside Mrs. Chimola's room and one below. When we opened those manholes, we pulled a lot of vapes out of there. Yeah, I mean, so that goes to, to what you guys are doing in terms of drug and alcohol prevention and, oh, it's, um, you know, that these kids that are affecting the long-term loss of this we, district because they're, you know. Yes, I mean, we were shocked at the, at the They're jeopardizing the integrity of the sewer system. I mean, it's weird how all this comes together. So. I, I'm sorry, I'm all excited talking about this sewer <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, what was the other infrastructure thing that you just mentioned? I, I, about the Siemens. Sewer. Oh, Siemens, The yes. Siemens, so. Okay, so, so get that contract, and I'll have to go dig that one back out. They're not following through on an $8 million contract. Why are we not holding them harmful? Well, I, I believe that that's better discussed in executive session with the board. And I did give a memo to the board of high yesterday. Let me ask this. Can a contractor be held harmful for not following through on that contract? In your legal opinion, in well, general. I, I, I don't typically give legal opinions to the public. This, the board of my client, board's my client. But in general, a breach of contract, the contract can be held liable. A contractor, if you breach a contract and it causes damages, can be held liable. Okay. So basically, what we're doing, if I'm understanding you correctly, we're having, so that contract went through in 2019, and what was the, what was the span of the contract? Five years? I, I don't have the contract. I think it was longer. Because, yeah. but, but there was, or, I don't know, did I miss this? Are you talking about Siemens? Yeah. Yeah. And it was also recommended to <coughs> extend it and, and, and renew it, but like at a, at a second tier before the first tier was even proven valid and effect, effective. Okay. It was supposed to be covering debt and also extending the contract, which was voted against. But the contract, like we are, we, I don't know what the terms are. Part of the problem whether it's a baseboard or whatever, is because Siemens, the, the equipment right. that they installed, doesn't right. function with our old systems. Right. And there was no one competent to be able to assess that on our facilities and the connection with Siemens. And then compounding that is the fact that we're the contract tightest to only working with Siemens. Right. So it didn't matter if they were doing what was right or wrong. By signing that contract and then thankfully not extending it, we were locked in the Siemens for multiple years. I don't know if they were out of that contract yet, and they haven't performed. The equipment hasn't performed. We haven't proven the efficiencies in our heating. We've wasted more money in heating and air conditioning in our buildings because of the inefficiencies of that equipment that we spent millions of dollars on. Was there a non-compete built in? Non so, so you had to stick like, like, like with busing? There was a service contract. Yeah. Okay, so, so. That's expired. Okay. We did not so, renew so that's service. what yeah. gives you the right to go out to energy. Right. Yes. We, didn't, right. we didn't. But we have to pay energy. We well, you would have to pay Siemens too. So yeah. It was a service contract that expired. Remember, that's thankfully we didn't renew that extension. People with credentials in jobs to manage these things because when you put people without prior knowledge of certain situations into jobs, bad things happen. <laughs> uh, do we have any other <coughs> questions? for the exciting 
Building and Grounds Committee. Thanks for coming in. We're leading the church tonight. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have co curricular Mr. Swain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Boom. Uh, roll call, uh, two members present, myself and Mrs. Bibla. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the March committee meeting. I so move. Second. All in favor, aye. aye. Uh, and tonight we have two items to move forward to next week's voting session. Uh, item number five, one and two. Two baseball volunteers, all uh, clearances are on file, correct, Jack? That's correct. Uh, any questions from the board or the public? Seeing none, I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I do. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next transportation. Uh, <clears throat> be seeking a motion to approve the minutes of March 9, 2023 Transportation Committee meeting. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We will be seeking a recommendation to move items one and two to the April 20th uh, board meeting. Uh, questions or input from the board? Or the public? Seeing none, I will make the motion to move items one and two to next week's agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any open discussion pertaining to transportation? If not, we have run through all our committees and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for attending.